Hello and welcome to this discussion to coincide with Wildlife, Francis Bacon and Peter Beard, an exhibition at Ordovas in London until 16th of July. I'm Thomas Marx, the editor of Apollo magazine, and I'll be chairing this event as we explore the remarkable creative friendship between Francis Bacon and Peter Beard, a relationship that began in the mid-60s when Beard visited Bacon's studio at Rees Mews to find his wildlife photographs scattered all over the floor, covered in paint, and the friendship that would go on to involve correspondence, conversation, and the swapping of ideas and images, including of the artists themselves. Each artist appeared in the other's work in the decades of their friendship in strange, fecund new guises. We'll be discussing that exchange, how it informed both Bacon and Beard's visions of the complex meeting of human and animal, and not least in Beard's photographs of and collages showing dead elephants in Africa. I'm delighted to be joined by three speakers this evening. We'll speak for about 45 minutes, and then I hope we'll be able to take some questions from our live audience. Pilar Ordovas founded her gallery in 2011, uh, dealing in modern and contemporary art often working with leading international museums such as the Courtauld, Dulwich Picture Gallery and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. She was previously International Director and Deputy Chairman of Post-War and Contemporary Art in Europe at Christie's and for two years a Director of Gagosian in London. Sophie Pretorius is archivist of the Estate of Francis Bacon Collection. Uh, she's published widely on Bacon, including a study called A Pathological Painter, Francis Bacon and the Control of Suffering. And she visited Peter Beard in advance of this exhibition uh, in Montauk, his house in Long Island in 2019. Uh, Beard sadly died uh, early last year, so one of the last people to talk to Beard about Bacon. Uh, and her a wonderful essay is in the catalogue for this Order Vass exhibition. And Simon Martin, uh, I'm delighted, is here, the director of Pallant House Gallery in Chichester. Uh, Simon has curated many exhibitions about modern British art, written books on Edward Barra, John Minton, Eduardo Paolozzi, Piper and others. Uh, he's a trustee of the Charleston Trust and on the advisory committee, the Fabric Advisory Committee of Chichester Cathedral. Um, I'm going to start by asking you, Pilar, to give us a sense of what's in the exhibition here and how it came about, in fact. Sure. Um, so the exhibition came about in 2018. I was actually, Bacon is, is the reason why it all started. Uh, we were shown in our New York gallery, Bacon's Women, and Neshma and Sophie came to visit. Um, Sophie had been researching and talking to Peter and they told me you should come and see the archives and we should think further if there is a show there. I spent um, the beginning of 2019, uh, a most wonderful day at the archives, looking at so much material. I was so overwhelmed um, by the work, by the diaries, by so much to take in. And I came out of that meeting with Neshma um, thinking I definitely want to work with Peter's work and with Neshma and I want to think what the first show should be. Seeing the Bacon material all together for the first time, the Dead Elephant Diary, it really spoke to me as this should be the beginning of uh, working with Peter's work. I have often, in the exhibitions we have done in our almost 10 years of gallery, tried to look at relationships that are overlooked, um, an aspect of an artist's work that is perhaps not so known. And what really attracted me was how both of them um, shared so much in their practice. Uh, they both work with photography in different ways. We have always seen and been uh, Peter has been described as a photographer, but he is so much more than a photographer. And he did use photography in a very similar way to Bacon, um, you know, to this as, as evidence, like Sophie says in her essay. 
that and the fact that they had both sort of been models for each other's work. And not only that, that the friendship had lasted from the moment they met at the Marlborough Gallery, only a few streets away from here, in 1967, until Bacon died, they were really good friends. And when you see the archival material downstairs, both from the Bacon State and from the Peter Beard State, there is correspondence and exchange of ideas, interviews, letters in between each other, images. Um, so I was really excited to be able to, in a way, shed some light in this creative relationship. And just for people who, who hopefully will be able to come to this exhibition, if they're in London uh, or able to get to London, a sense of what we have on the walls around us and a sense of how you've juxtaposed the works. So one of the crucial ideas, which I'm sure Sophie will go into much more detail than I, um, that really linked the two of them together were the dead elephant interviews, which took place in 1972. Uh, these were to form the basis of a new edition of The End of the Game, which was obviously the book that he published in 1965. And both Bacon and Beard were very concerned about Africa and how animals were being treated. And these photographs, aerial photographs of elephants, form really an important part of their friendship, the discussions of the role of the artist in this very, very crucial conservation. Um, so these interviews, which have never been seen or heard before, um, are being played in the gallery. And many of these aerial photographs that were also found in Bacon's studio on his death are downstairs. So downstairs, we have created more of an archival room with correspondence in between the two artists with the dead elephant diaries, as well as many of the photographs dedicated to um, the dead elephants. And upstairs, we have shown the work that really shows the two of them in each other's work. So behind us is the portrait from 1976 of Peter Veard, in which you can see how Bacon has morphed also his own features into Beard. And then we have around us um, the photographs that Peter Beard took in the studio of 80 Narrow Street of Bacon. And we also have, on the other side, some of the diary images. I'm just saying images, but there are so much deep so much richer than images. There are collages, there is writing, there are objects included with these collages. But be it had, um, we have two contact sheets right next to us which were done in 75, 76, many of which include, for example, the diptych that is behind us. And he was given access to seeing works in progress in Bacon's studio. So we're trying to piece together those, the relationship in between the two of them, the body of work they both created, inspired by each other, and those subjects that were important to the two of them. Well, there are lots of things you've mentioned there that I want to delve into during this discussion. Uh, not least the use of repetition of images and this extraordinary use of collage uh, and assemblage as well that Peter Beard uses both in his diaries and in his larger scale collage works, many of which use images of Bacon himself and reproductions of Bacon's works. But Sophie, let me ask you, if we may, if we can just delve a little bit more into the history of this friendship. I think a lot of people know about Bacon's friendship with Freud, Bacon's friendship with the two Roberts in London, and that milieu and Soho, not far from where we are, in fact, right now. But can you just give us a bit of a sense of how this friendship between these two artists, different generations, developed? So um, the two, well, there are two versions of the story, both told by Peter. <laughs> one in which they meet in 1965, the more likely one is 1967. Um, they were both at a very interest, like sort of uh, the point at which both of their careers took off. Bacon was perpetually late. He himself would claim that that he only started painting late in his life, um, and the bulk of his work came came later on. But he had just had his first two major retrospectives: the first at the Tate, and the second at the Guggenheim. Um, and Peter had just released *The End of the Game*, which is still his most famous work. Um, and they were at one of Bacon's 
exhibitions at Marlborough. And Peter came up to him and said, oh, I'm Peter Beard, here I am. And uh, Francis sort of coquettishly said, I know who you are. Um, and that's a part of their friendship that can't be overlooked is the flirtation. Um, and sort of something that can't be left unsaid with Peter's work is that he was a very handsome man. Um, and that, that formed a lot of the draw for, for Bacon. He liked men with good bone structure and he liked men involved in crime. And, and Peter was both, um, not, not in a, Peter in a more noble way than a lot of Bacon's other subjects. Um, but they began a correspondence uh, sharing mainly images um, and often calling each other. We obviously don't know the content of those phone calls. Uh, but in Bacon's studio when he died were a huge amount, hundreds of images of uh, the dead elephants we have around us, but also his photos of the San Quentin prisons that was taken, um, which are atrocious and really quite difficult to look at. But they had a, a shared fascination for uh, docu um, extreme affecting images uh, that captured, captured intense emotion very quickly. And I, both of them had this obsession with photography and its ability to, to change your perception of the world. Um, and also with contact sheets, and I'm very pleased to see them all up on the wall, and they're so, so much bigger than I assumed they were, but the contact sheet as a, um, as a moment in which you can see multiple moments presented on one, one um, picture plane. It's like a, a sort of filmic vision slapping you in the face in one moment, and they both had an obsession with that. Simon, let me ask you about um the vision of a friendship that we see around us, sort of not going from the documentary evidence uh, and the archives of what we know about their friendship, but just your sense of how a friendship is, re is represented in the works that are gathered in this exhibition. I mean, it's an interesting question with Bacon because I mean, lots of his relationships, as we know, were quite complex with, with other artists. Um, what fascinates me about seeing these is we, we know how much, as, you, as Sophia said, how, how Bacon would draw on photographers such as Boybridge or John Deakin. And um, at Pallant House Gallery, we've got the Colony Room, which is almost a snapshot, this painting by Michael Andrews. And there's, there's Bacon and there's John Deakin, and there's Bruce Bernard and Henrietta Moraes. And you get that sense of these, these um, relationships, close social, often, often driven by, by um, socialising and drinking. Um, and in, in, the, in, in, in this relationship, there's, there's a really symbiotic thing. And I think what, what you see with a lot of the, both artists is similar themes emerging. And, and I, I was fascinated that Bacon his, his mother and his sisters had moved to Africa. Um, and, and he, before meeting um, Peter Beard, he had, he had produced works around um, depicting elephants, for example. And it's almost like the friendship, that meeting kind of consolidated these, these themes which were already emerging in Bacon's work. And, and you, it's, a, it's extraordinary intense and close friendship over a long period of time. And I think the fact that you have that sequence of portraits, and of course we've got a, um, a couple here, is a real you know, demonstration of that, but actually also how certain thematics like the use of blood in, in Francis Bacon's paintings, but also this use of blood as a kind of background in the collages in Peter's work, that, that they're, they're both in very, very different ways, addressing similar ideas. Attitudes to Africa and how they evolved almost in each other's work, but, but also Peter Beard, I think his own evolving attitude to Africa is something we'll come on to. On to. But, but Sophie, to go back to you, um, just to give us a bit more sense, I, I mean, Bacon, his legend at least, needs no introduction, but, but Peter Beard's legend perhaps certainly for um, an, an, Engl an, an audience in, in London perhaps needs a, a bit more uh, of um, an outline. Um, can you tell our story of the man that 
you met, the character that you met when you visited Peter Beard in Long Island? It's going to be difficult to fit into a few words. He was, I mean, I know it's a very sort of worn out phrase, larger than life, but he, it, he had, just his voice as you went into a room boomed. So you almost had to sort of, Peter, it's okay, I can hear you. But um, he, he was born into a railroad um, and uh, textile family um, in New York. And he had a fascination very early on with, with animals and with containing what was a sort of captured element. He obsessively kept diaries, which is something we were talking about earlier. This, um, if nothing else, and there is a lot else, uh, his diaries form an incredible capsule of uh, the late 20th century and the, the culture he was a part of. But he, he had this obsession with animals and he started, he went into medicine first of all, and he, he quit due to what he called a distaste for humanity. And he got rid of that. And he was friends with um, a large amount of people going out to Kenya. Uh, uh, Charles Darwin's great-grandson, uh, Quentin Keynes, and a bunch of others. And he went out and he met uh, the sort of out of Africa lot um, and fell in love with Kenya especially. Uh, and started his more obsessive diary keeping while he was out there and literally collecting the dust and the leaves and the blood of African animals. And he, like Bacon, had been collecting photographic images of Africa because alongside the, the hunting big game in Africa, there was the hunting with a camera of big game in Africa because um, as an African myself, I, these animals don't seem that strange, but as, a, as an outsider, the, I think the sheer oddness of African animals and their size um, is something that you can't help but be fascinated with. And the, what became, he calls it, uh, uh, he says he, it began as a sort of um, courtship of Africa and it became a record of assault because even then in the 60s, Kenya had started to, um, white man's involvement in Kenya had started to show its ugly face. <laughs> And uh, the, the, even the well-meaning efforts of conservationists, it just, just the, the sort of folly of man thinking that, that one could control nature was coming to a head. And it's the difference between these photographs that he had collected as a boy and that Bacon had such a fascination with as well, the same sources, Maxwell, those sort of people, um, and the pictures that he was taking and side by side, and that's the important thing, the comparison, um, you can't help but feel something incredibly wrong is happening. And so that's where the end of the game came from. I think it's very interesting that that book, in a sense, published over multiple editions over a couple of decades and updated so that I mean, almost like a, a book that in a very different context, something like Tom Phillips's Humament is something that is always going to be a very different book in its different editions, insofar as someone working with collage also has that feeling for a book that evolves over time as you publish new editions of it and has different attitudes to its subject matter, even though it reuses some of the same images. And I feel like that is something we see in those diaries as well, the day-by-day -day making of the world by piecing together different images, some pop, some repeated versions, scaled up, scaled down of Beard's photographs, the writing, the drawings. Pilar, give us a sense of though this correspondence, um, the, the sense of the images and how they were swapped between uh, the, these two artists. Um, I understand that, that perhaps most notably uh, Beard sent several dozen of the dead elephant photographs to Bacon and, and that became very important to him. Well, in his latest edition of the end of the game in 77 there were 147 images of dead elephants and I believe there were over 200 images found on the floor of Bacon's studio. Um, I think one point that is very important and crucial, we talk now about conservation and there and this is a very normal word to use and to be aware of what man is doing to animals in Africa. But this in 1965 was 
quite something, and this is the first time that the book was published. I, I think it's also really interesting when you talk about the imagery and the collages. Some, especially the different editions of the book, for me, they are a visual essay, and a lot of his work is telling you a story, and the images change, and you have the different elements of the blood, or even of the language that, as Sophie says in her essay, that they both share. The language they both almost had like a shorthand. They knew what they were talking about when they were looking at certain images. And that transposes also into Bacon's work. You have the triptych from 1976, in which he's using the elephant embryo. He's using the image of Peter um, in Kenya. So there were certain images that triggered, as Bacon said, ideas and thoughts that were immediate. So there was no need to talk they were just triggered. And those triggers for Bacon were as important as any words. So I think sending each other those images, but then when you look at some of the correspondence, especially on Peter's side, which also is reflected in his work, when you see his writing, everything is a work of art. The envelope that he sends the letter to Bacon in, one of the envelopes is actually the front cover of our catalogue with an image of his daughter and a print of his hand. So everything is really, you know, there is not a space that is left without any attention. What I think is so interesting about that envelope is that these number of stamps, and some of them become like a miniature picture gallery. Yes. So, uh, and then there is a huge amount of decoration of the envelope, little doodles. There's obviously the address, and so you lose track somewhere of what is functional about this letter and this correspondence, what is ornamental, but what is also somehow perhaps mystical in some yes. way, or mythical for, for Beard himself. Um, uh, Simon, let me ask you, um, this sort of idea of, of swapping images in the 60s and 70s, I mean, where would you place this particular exchange in, I suppose, the greater, the wider climate of the exchange of images between artists. In, in it, it, it's fascinating, um, those friendships and how it, certain images appear. When I was looking at some of the photographs by Peter, Peter Beard of, of Africa in, in um, the mid-60s, that actually 10 years earlier, in 1952, Sidney Nolan had done a whole series of photographs of the drought in Queensland, which inspired a series of paintings. And of course, there was a very strong friendship between um, um, Sidney Nolan and, and Bacon. And you, you sometimes see these kind of themes going between them. And I think it, it's fascinating how fast forward to the 1970s, and Sidney Nolan is then himself influenced by Peter Beard. Um, so, so it's 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 in 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 um, a ballet that he designed in 1977, and there's a set design, and so there are very interesting um, relationships, not just with 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 um, Francis Bacon, but with with others. And I think there's absolutely this oscillation. I think with, and I think it, it seems to me that there is such intent, particularly with the collages, of how how they're pieced together. There is no accident. And it's, and I think also the, the, the combination of elements of poetry as well. And this, of course, is something that Bacon is interested in. He does the series of heads of William Blake, for example, and, and you see quotations from T.S. Eliot in some of them. And so so it is, they are very, very dense visual well, document. Intense. I, I feel this shared intensity of Bacon and Beard. Um, the intensity, of, I suppose, with Bacon of, of sometimes boiling down images from other sources into something that is composite. And a different type of intensity in, in, in the Beard. Um, intensity in the detail, in the obsessiveness, in, I mean, something that dare I say it, it has almost an outsidery nature to it, at least insofar as the line is so refined and, and the strange neatness almost, the wonderful neatness of this handwriting on things that otherwise are quite chaotic. Did you ever see, Sophie, I, I know you spend time at Rees Muse and uh, some sort of congruence between, I suppose, the ordered chaos of some of 
Bacon, uh, Beard's images and, uh, and what Bacon's extraordinary chaos, but the creative chaos of his studio. Well, there's often, I mean, I think the word most repeated in Peter's correspondence with Bacon is um, the word oasis or compost, uh, that he thought he was sort of giving, I guess, arms to the, the giant uh, wetness that was Bacon's studio, just layer upon layer of images that breeded other images. And this is, again, again harks back to the concept of collage, that placing images that aren't meant to be together, they sort of breed and they create something new. Um, and yeah, in their, their shared practice, they had this, this ability to, uh, to pick on, and it seemed just a sort of uh, very blasé way, a shared sensibility. They picked up on the same um, intense moments in literature, sort of, I mean, it's the one everyone picks up on, but the horror, the horror of, of Conrad, that 76 triptych. Um, but they both had uh, uh, interest in Yeats and especially the second coming. And that triptych is, is I think, I, like I said, a shorthand of, of their whole friendship. Um, they both in their sort of collecting of images and quotations uh, created like an evidence room and it was as if a, gr a great crime had been committed and they didn't know they couldn't quite tell who'd done it yet but the they were both they these images bore some kind of trace and that's for both of them in some way um, to generalize something about you know the relationship of a man to the world around him is that, would you, would you say that sort of... I think in, they both saw in Africa, at least, a, um, a sort of large playing out of, uh, in, in the European sensibility, a death of uh, the human scale of death, the, the man as an animal. And in Africa, you have the largeness of the animals and the amount of them. And in Peter's images, the, the shocking death of so many of them that Peter had an obsession with how similar we were to elephants, them, like specifically elephants, but that it says something much greater about the, what the European conception of Africa and how we treat it says something much bigger about the European sensibility and our relationship to our animal selves. I'll come back to, to um, animals and, and indeed to the attitudes to Africa in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, a sort of last thing on this friendship, um, quite specifically about the sharing of each other's image. Um, uh, we've got behind us um, uh, Bacon's, some of Bacon's many paintings of Beard. I think there are three or four triptychs. Is that right, Pilar? Yeah, nine works in total. So there are not so many of them. Um, there are two triptychs, two diptychs, no, actually there are three triptychs, two diptychs and some single panels. Is there something special about the image of Beard for Bacon or, as Sophie was perhaps slightly hinting earlier, is it there's something about the high cheekbones, the handsome young man that is a, is a an archetypal Bacon subject, or does he do something particular with, with Beard's image? I don't know whether Sophie would agree with me. I don't think there is an archetypal. I think there are those people that really interest him and fascinate him, either because of the bone structure, the love he feels for them, or how important they are to him. And obviously, as he got older, he said, I have no one else to paint, I paint myself. So there was a combination of those. He hardly ever took any commissions. I think there were only two that I know of. Um, so he obviously painted him because he was interested in him, both as a person and as a subject. And obviously, when you look at the paintings, that bone structure, what fascinates me is how he merges himself with the subject, which he doesn't just do with Peter Beard. I know he did it with um, George Dyer. He does it with other subjects that, that he feels particularly you know, he did it with several portraits of Freud, and I'm sure if 
if Martin was here, he would tell me he did it with all of those subjects that he felt were incredibly good looking. So there, there was that sense that you're looking at the subject, but you're looking at him as well, in the same way that you always have the glass and you are reflected in his own work. So it's all these different layers that we see in Beard, we see in Bacon. So let's flip it on its head and think about the image of Bacon for Beard. Um, I mean, Simon, Bacon's image um, became very well known in the second half of the 20th century. It was quite widely photographed. Um, of course, he was uh, represented by Freud. They represented each other. What, what version of Bacon are you seeing in, in these works, in the photographs by Beard? It, it, it's a very casual and image of, of, I mean, if we look at the ones over here where he's outside, for example, in seen almost in profile, in, in, in the studio and, of course, by the water over here, there, there is almost a painterly quality to some of them um, where they're not entirely precise images. Um, he's, I think he's, he's, he's perhaps thinking about how, how Bacon paints himself. Well, the Bacon in motion to some degree or an attempt to represent Bacon in motion. And Bacon's faces are faced if that makes sense, in one of the collages that I, I think our audience will be able to see in the film uh, again at the end of our discussion. Sophie, for you, working with the, the, the estate, you've seen so many images of Bacon. Is there something particular about these? I also wonder, before you answer that, whether you know, there's a version of Beard that is the fashion photographer Beard as well, the, the glamour, the celebrity. Does that come into these photos that Beard took of Bacon? I think to a degree they were both like um, glamorous people to each other for different reasons and for similar reasons too. Um, these photos we're talking about in particular, the Narrow Street photographs on the roof of a, a building Bacon bought on Narrow Street out by the river. And there's uh, diary extract that Peter, when Peter talks about this day and he says well, the first we're all, we're all very, very proper, nice bacon face profile um, and he says in the last role he, he decided to experiment and to ask Bacon to turn his head as the photograph was being taken, obviously inspired by Bacon's own paintings. But I think what comes across in Peter's photographs of Francis and also in the Dead Elephant interviews, when you listen to them in their raw form, is the, the level of uh, intimacy that Peter was able to um, evoke with Bacon. That most of the time you get Bacon the myth, the, the sort of frowning, scowling man who, uh, who does, isn't fragile. Um, but the flirtation aspect of their relationship meant that parts of Bacon were open to Peter that weren't open to other um, photographers. Well, Beard says in, um, I think it's in the Big Tashin uh, Peter Beard book, uh, published 2019, I think, so just before Peter Beard's death, um, he makes the claim at some point that, that he was the only person who was ever allowed to photograph Bacon's paintings in progress. Is that a, a slightly spurious there, claim? There is one other person, <laughs> but in, ter um, in terms of, I mean, it is true that he was one of, the, he, maybe one of the very few people allowed to witness paintings in progress. There are many photos of Bacon's studio by professional photographers, but at that point all the unfinished canvases are carefully tucked away, and it's invaluable. I mean, Martin's text in our upcoming Francis Bacon Studies 4 about destroyed Bacon paintings some of them are from Peter's photographs because uh, he was there taking, taking photos all the time of, of Bacon and most of, some of them don't survive or whole figures are edited out. Um, and the only way we have any evidence of that is through Peter's photographs. I'm going to stay with you, Sophie, and, and take us back into the, the larger subject of this meeting with um, with Africa and with the landscape and, and the, uh, the animals of Africa. Um, Bacon, 
perhaps people know or don't know, I mean, he made many visits to Africa, in fact. Uh, I think there are five visits to South Africa, uh, where many his sister and mother know. lived, and many to North Africa as well. But to a degree, is there anything more for Bacon in sub-Saharan Africa? I'm sure there is, but is it primarily a familial link and to a certain degree even a touristic one for him? I think, I mean, if we were to compare Beard and Bacon's relationships, Beard certainly had the deeper, more sympathetic relationship with Africa. Um, Bacon's family are an old, I, 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 not quite old money, but old English family, and they, um, their rise and fall sort of was analogous to the rise and fall of the British Empire, and so the emotion was settlers' emotion. Um, but Bacon did change his style after his first visit to Africa, especially the painting of grass. He talks about the violence of the grass, uh, especially in relation to Van Gogh, and um, those those plains. I mean, they literally are quite painful to walk through, <laughs> um, but his, I think that the intensity um, of, of his visits there, and also probably what it meant for his family, all the female members of his family within a decade moved out there after his father died, and uh, stayed there, became a part of, of that culture, and so his family became African. Part of him was there, his mm. mother was there, yes. but I suppose it was also a place of displacement of, of his family. And then, I mean, there's the issue of North versus Southern Africa in the European conception, because North Africa has always been quite Oriental, um, and they've been taking great pains to so separate Egypt from the rest of Africa, that's not quite. But um, he, he visited Tangier as much as he visited any of the European uh, holiday destinations he went to because of the gay scene there but also because it was so beautiful and the artistic scene that went on in in northern Africa but they both be Peter and Francis saw Egyptian funerary art as the pinnacle of artistic creation that the Egyptians in a very direct way uh, ancient Egyptians uh, saw art as your your way of living on that, that, and in a very direct way, in an interview with William Burroughs for Arena, Bacon said, well, that's what we've got. We've got dust and art, that's it. And Burroughs was arguing for sort of post-human, um, what is it called, where you project your, your soul onto the so ether. Psychosis yeah, yeah. And Bacon said, nope, it's dust and art, <laughs> that's it. I don't know about that. To open it to Pilar and, and to Simon, uh, I suppose there are many things that might make us feel quite uncomfortable in some of these images, as, as Bacon's art often does, but perhaps some of the images in, in Beard might make us feel uncomfortable in different ways than they might have done 30, 40 years ago when they first appeared. How, how do you feel about, about that? What, what are the things that... Um, do you feel like Beard set out to make us feel discomforted in certain ways? I think, to me, a lot of great art has that ability and has the ability to move you to create that really strong emotion. So, yes, I think certainly he does. And then, you know, as we have been talking through, through this evening, there are many themes and many areas in which he wants you to experience that discomfort. And I think, to me, that's a great thing because they generate that fault when you're looking at them. And the more you look, in the same way when you look at a great work by Bacon, the more you look, the more you see, and the more you learn, really. In a strange way, the work that gave me a real frisson standing in front of it is the one that is just behind our, our panel, um, which has two images of Bacon's studio and then just one of the dead elephant uh, photographs, almost again like a postage stamp in yes. the bottom right corner. And it's an uncomfortable, or it makes uncomfortable sense somehow. I, I feel that the, the human fingerprints, yes. that, that it feels like Peter Beard is, set, is, is placing culpability with, with humanity. And I think what, what Bacon does is he uses animalistic 
qualities to show the savagery of humanity. And so there's an interesting thing going on there, I think. You know, they're, they're both essentially doing something similar. Um, I'm just going to remind our audience uh, that if they are on YouTube watching this, they can insert questions into uh, the YouTube um, chat box, and I hope we'll be able to take some of those for our panelists. Um, Simon, just, just to come back to you though, do, this, mo this notion of what is discomforting, um, and also perhaps how, I mean, I suppose with Peter Beard, the, there's always a, a feeling that, that he's very conscious of his own evolving relationship to Africa. Um, but are, are there things here, do you feel like we have to be quite careful in historicizing these works now when we look at them? Possibly. Um, I, I think in a way, with the passing of time, these things become more resonant because actually we, 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 if, if we look at them through the lens of conservation, for example, they are important documents of that um, be, because of what we know has happened in the last 50 years in Africa. So on, on that alone, there is something very significant, but actually there's a lot more going on with these works than, uh, in a way, what we have here with the collages is that the, the elephant photographs, which of course have had books in their own right, are part of that narrative and they're kind of about leading our, our mind to a certain conclusion sometimes. What fascinates me also is, is the mixture of other almost incidental material. It's, it's rather like um, an artist such as Eduardo Paolozzi, for example, who will bring lots and lots of different things together. And there is no one conclusive reading, but it, 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 it opens things up and it places, you know, quite a few of the things which are in them place them in their time um, more than some of those photographs of Africa could almost have happened more recently. You know, you see them and they, they, they still seem very, very contemporary. Well, um, Peter, in one of his letters to Bacon, says, I feel my collages don't pick up any interest for the first 10 years. Um, and I, I think that that's their real um, value societally will be, will be determined in, in a while from now. <laughs> It's interesting that that feeling of collage picking up meaning over time, because I suppose that, that there was one um, expression, I, I, I think it is Peter Beard's own one, that he called it these day-by-day -day diary collages. Um, and I suppose a day-by-day -day diary is something that is quite mundane, but it's almost as though he, he was trying to work out problems on a daily basis through images? Well, the day-by-day -day thing comes into this whole notion of trance which is and repetition, which is something both artists shared an obsession with, um, that repetitive action or repetitive images um, can lead to greater concentration due to a sort of infinitesimal, noticing infinitesimal details between images. The Mybridge images being the most famous example that one can ascertain uh, greater truth through comparison of similar images because it allows you to focus on very small differences but also the, um, the madness of monotony that, that uh, in, their, in their interviews Bacon talks about water dripping on your forehead or dripping over there can drive you mad because it proves to you that there's something outside of you that continues despite your existence and they uh, the collages and the, the diaries that Peter kept, and it, they really are day by day, every day. There's, there's a quote from Owen Edwards, who, who's written a lot about uh, Peter Beard, where he says um, on the collages that there's certainly never been anything quite like them this side of Bedlam. And, and there's that, sort of, <laughs> that madness of repetition. But another, I think, incredibly resonant but simple phrase from Beard is the deepening of repetition. Um, and of course, poets have known that, that repetition is not a dullness and a, a blunting, a, a blunting of something. It, it's an enriching with difference uh, and sometimes also a, a shamanic potential. The, 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 the charm or the spell of repetition is that it can catch us up in, in its magic uh, in some ways. There's a question uh, here on YouTube 
um, Pila, I'm going to ask you, um, which is a single work of Bacon that best represents his friendship with Peter Beard. I think we were just talking about the triptych from 1976, which really sort of has all the elements and all the shorthand vocabulary between the two of them. Um, One of the things in that work, if I'm not mistaken, is this photograph that it seems both Beard and Bacon were obsessed by, which is of Beard uh, with his shaved head when he's been released from um, yes. uh, 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 a short stay in, in a prison in, in Kenya. Um, and that finds its way in, and he is like a Mr. Kurtz figure almost, but also still a very handsome figure. Yes, I mean, amongst the photographs that he sent to Bacon uh, of animals and photos that were important to the two of them, he sent him a number of photos of himself. And this was an image that was found in multiple versions in the studio. And you can see it around here in some of Peter's work as well. And the irony was not lost on Bacon of him. He was arrested for uh, assaulting a poacher, and yeah. and so it all it all ties up. Um, Simon, to, to go back to this, this feeling of collage, I, I know that you mentioned Paolozzi, who's someone you've done quite a lot of work on. Um, I mean, for me, though, these, these take collage in a, in a different direction, and, and partly that's the, um, the sort of almost violence that is done to some of the sheets with the smearing, I believe in some cases, of, of materials like animal blood, is, 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 that's right, and the insistence on found objects. Where, where do you see them in that sort of the post-war collage tradition. I mean, there are so many poppy collage artists, but these are, these are different. Yes, I mean, I think there are, there are rel relatively few, I mean, there are artists who have used blood, but, but that's quite an extreme thing. And it's almost, um, it almost reminds me of what Chris Afili did in his series of paintings where he used elephant dung. He actually bringing materials into, into the work. So there's a there's a binding medium within the actual construction. Um, with, with some of the pieces that we have here as well, I think there's, there is that referencing of the Mybridge pieces, that, Mybridge photographs that, that Bacon also looks at. So he's, there's, there's, there's a playfulness, I think, going on here as well. It's kind of fascinating. But, but also these, 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 these elements of almost kind of pop culture that, that are slotted in around them, which, which aren't necessarily about Africa. One of the things I find so intense is that they are both, in some senses, horrific, but also, in some places, very funny. Uh, I can see across here, again, I hope it might be shown in the, the video in a few minutes, I can see an element, I think, of what looks like an image of roast turkey or something from, a, from a, a, some food packaging, but next to it, images of Bacon paintings and of Bacon himself. Um, I mean, that's, that's quite an unusual tone. The, you know, it's not the horror, the horror. It's almost the, f the first time as horror, the second time as fast, to, to adapt a phrase. Well, it's like Bacon would, would say, he passed a butcher's and go, it's very strange that I'm not up there. Um, he made lots of comments about how when he was a teenager, he saw dog shit on the street and thought, that's what life is like. It's like dog shit. And there is this sort of abjection um, as the punchline, like, like to make you flinch, but, all, but also it is, I, I mean, that's where a lot of humor comes from. The, the, the sort of uh, insanity of, of the human condition. Well, it's, it's not that far off in some ways from Bacon's fellow displaced Irishman, Samuel Beckett, uh, in, in places. Pilar, in terms of that sense of horror, humour, visual surprise, was just to round this conversation off, how are visitors responding to, to these images and the difference between seeing these things uh, as, as physical artworks or as digital images? Because they are quite reproducible, but they do something differently in the flesh. I, I, I think... I mean, I would agree that nothing really reproduces us standing in front of it. 
and especially for Beard's work and also for Bacon, but for Beard's work, for me, it's almost three-dimensional. So you really have to stand and see them and look at the layering, look at the objects, the stones downstairs with that elephant photograph in which he's collected lots of pebbles and feathers. And I mean, they are so rich that all of that is really lost in a reproduction. The public has been really overwhelming in the last, since we've been able to open on the 12th of April, we have welcomed thousands of visitors to the gallery and I hope we'll be welcoming many more. Yeah, I'm gonna ask another question because something has popped up on YouTube which is linked to these um, stones and, and objects appearing, but perhaps if you can, can you give us a bit more sense of actually how Peter Beard assembled these collages. I'm not sure which of you is best placed to I think so answer that. Because when she was last uh, with Peter and they were talking and she was interviewing him, at the same time he was working on the floor. So I think she'll be able yeah. to tell you how. But he was, I mean, I almost never stopped and to create as much as he did. You can't stop ever. But as I was trying to interview him, he had, towards the end of his life, he was creating these giant uh, blow-up photographs of elephants with collage borders. Um, and I, as I was talking to him, he was uh, rushing around, sticking things down, picking up feathers that he'd picked up on a walk outside and pebbles from the cl beautiful cliff outside his house. Um, but he would, he would shut me up. And on the television would be Trump or something, and he'd photograph the television, pause, photograph, go to his printer, print out the photograph, cut it out, stick it on the can, uh, stick on not the canvas, the the paper, um, and so it was it was with a sort of maniacal vigor that he collected these things. But stones in particular, he wrote to Bacon often about stones, saying, "Well, I found some good stones here, and some like each one is like a photograph." He said that you could contemplate it as a moment of um, of uh, happenings in the universe, all in this one, one thing, and yeah, stones were were of great significance to him and his work. I think if I may, we've talked about uh, when we see the horror and the elements, but we haven't talked about the beauty. And I think there is also a lot of beauty, and I think that's a very important point to make for both artists within this horror and shock there is an incredible uh, sense of beauty. And I think the sense of beauty, a beauty, um, as it were, made richer through the kind of variety of tone that emerges from both the Bacon and Beard works here, and indeed from their friendship, is a, is a good place for us to end the discussion. Uh, I will say thank you very much to our speakers, to Simon Martin, Sophie Pretorius, and to Pilar Ordovas, and I'm going to get this right, I hope. The exhibition Wildlife, uh, Francis Bacon and Peter Beard, runs until 16th of July at Ordovas in London. Um, we're going to now play out with the video of the exhibition so you're able to see some more of the Beard and Bacon works.